Um, so to cut a long story short, um, where to start from? Hello, the people I know. Um, hello, the people I don't know. Um, I've been hacking around in Meteor for the best part of a year. Um, before that, I used to work as an interest rates trader uh, for a large American bank. Don't throw things at me. Um, if you really want to, then do it later because there's like AP equipment. Um, and ever since I kind of start to learn about um, Meteor's data model, which uh, is all about kind of real-time data um, reactivity, it occurred to me that there was probably a, a decent financial application uh, for that. Um, I think the, uh, I think I have to remember what's in my slides, which I may not do. Yeah, so w when you start thinking about finance and Meteor um, or, or uh, IT applications in general, everybody's um, knee-jerk reaction is, well, the latency is too high, the latency is going to be too high, you need to be ultra-low latency. And that's definitely true for certain sorts of things. So obviously high-frequency trading, mm -hmm. most algo trading, you really need very low latency. But there are, uh, there's a huge proportion of the market which is, or, or trading volume in the market, which is done by people who are making decisions using their brains. Um, and to be honest, the latency of my brain is a lot higher than the latency of pretty much any data model, um, or at least I suspected it was, so I thought it was kind of worth, but for a while I've been, been thinking it's kind of worth testing this out to see if you can get a, a connection over Meteor, which is, um, the, 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 use the Meteor data model um, on a sufficiently low latency basis that um, it would provide information which was um, not going to meaningfully um, impact the decisions made by a trader who was looking at all sorts of kind of charts and data on a screen um, and then making decisions whether to buy or sell and how much and so on. Um, but this is, just before we get going, this is not something I'm actually using or wanting to use. This is purely just to see what Meteor can do effectively. It's like a, a straw man, I suppose. Um, so yeah, Meteor's data latency, I suppose, th the point is, is a lot less than my brain's data latency, uh, my brain's latency, which is the important thing. Uh, secondarily, so I, I had these thoughts several months ago and didn't do anything about it because, you know, obviously I don't. Um, but of late, I've become quite obsessed with Meteor's low-level publications API for reasons that I don't really understand. But basically, in Meteor, that there it runs a pub sub model and there's a high level publications API and a low level public publications API. Can I just ask who is familiar in any respect with Meteor pub sub? Quite a few people. And who has used the low level publications API knowingly? A few people. So, so what I mean is essentially the high level API is where you are um, running some um, find on the server you're basically returning a cursor to the, the client, uh, the subscribing client, and you can do all sorts of things within that. So obviously it could be a fairly complex query. You could be kind of tr uh, using some transform and limit and, and sort and, and skip and so on. But essentially you're returning, the, you're returning a cursor or series of cursors to the client. Um, you're actually not returning the cursor because obviously um, over DDP, which is the protocol that Meteor uses to uh, communicate between server and client, um, it's only it's kind of like an extended uh, JSON um, set of objects which are uh, transferable, so you can't transfer a cursor. What when you return the cursor from the published function, Meteor in the background works out what that means. So it works out what the the um, objects that are the, the documents um, that are returned by that uh, cursor are, and updates them and tells the client to update them reactively. You can kind of bypass that with the low-level publications API um, and say explicitly to the uh, subscribing client, okay, add this document, okay, change this document, okay, remove this document, and that's regardless of whether there is an underlying collection on the um, server side or not, or even whether there is a collection, but you don't actually want to communicate exactly what is happening in that collection. You want to communicate something quite radically different. Uh, that's slightly premature, but there we are. We'll come to that in a second. Um, so the, um, I actually wrote a blog post about the low-level low publications API because I think it's really interesting. And there's all sorts of questions you see asked on Stack Overflow and elsewhere, which could be resolved quite easily by using this low-level publications API. But it seems like because it comes so early in the documentation, people kind of just skip over it and move to the more interesting stuff. Um, the most unsatisfying thing, though, was the fact that um, I couldn't think of a really good use case. So in, in, with a low-level publications API, the obvious use case um, beyond what you could do with a high-level API is doing something completely outside Meteor, so like returning to the client the result of some uh, kind of uh, third-party API, so you, you um, 
on a sessional basis, you're contacting some uh, REST endpoint and getting a bunch of objects and you want to put them in a, a client database, but you don't want to have to um, store them on the server or whatever, you can do that. So you can completely bypass any, any server-side collection. Or you could be, I don't have any experience with this, but I would imagine on a simple basis, it would be quite easy to run a query on a um, non-Monco database, so like a SQL database or something on the server side, return the results of that to the client without ever having to go through a, a MongoDB on the, the server side. But that to me seemed like it was going outside the Meteor world and not the example I wanted. And then, whilst I was watching the tour of Poland on TV, I don't know why, um, it occurred to me that actual fact these two things that I've alluded to and talked about for far too long uh, were perfectly aligned and um, candlestick charting was the perfect example of um, what you could do with a low-level publications API and also a good example of you know, some, some kind of financial application of, of Meteor. So this is just a chart of um, tick data. If you're looking at a, um, a pretty much any live traded market, um, the, the raw data is tick data, which just means that um, every line indicates that at a certain time, the, either the, the market price has changed or a trade has taken place, or, or you know, what, it, it could be either of those two things. Um, I don't actually know what this data is, it's just a picture I found on Google Images. But the, the frequency is um, completely unknown, it's like a, a Poisson process, but obviously in a slow market, um, in the middle of the night, you could get one tick every 10 minutes, whereas in a really fast market, um, in the middle of the day, you could get 50 ticks in a second. Uh, so just looking at the tick data or even trying to chart the tick data is not terribly useful, um, which is why almost ubiquitously um, people use ch candlestick charts, um, which look like these. You can see why they're called candlestick charts because they look a bit like candlestick, where for a given time period, so each of these bars represents the, the same time period, and that could be 30 seconds or 10 minutes or a day or a week or a month or whatever. Um, so they're, they're set time periods and it shows you, regardless how many ticks are contained within that bar, what the high, the low, the open, the close was. So the thick section is between open and close. The color gives you the, the net direction and the, the um, tails at the end show you where the absolute high and absolute low were. Um, and it occurred to me that um, transforming the tick data, so it's quite conceivable you could be storing tick data um, in a server um, and want to publish uh, candlestick um, data to clients. Um, that's because the, there is a, a transform that takes place um, based on the actual details of the candlestick chart. So if you had all this tick data, do you actually want to see 25 candles which are half an hour in duration or 50 candles which are 15 minutes in duration? What do you want to see? Well, you can do that all through the publish fun function. So this was the brief um, publish candlestick data using the tick data on, in one application using the low-level API, then write another application which was going to subscribe to that candlestick data, hat tip Alan Shaw because last month he did a really good talk on, it's actually server-to-server -server DDP but client-to-other server DDP is, you know, works the same way. Um, chart the results in a way that didn't look awful um, and that basically meant copying Cloud9 Trader because their charts look really nice so I just tried to copy that and then go back to what I was supposed to be doing before I started doing this. Um, the bad news is that tick data, this was partly predictable, but tick data is like impossible to get hold of. Um, I wanted something which is real time, because that if you're polling it, it kind of ruins the object of, of trying to look at the latency, because you, you obviously got loads of latency already baked in. Um, I, I couldn't find, there's, there's one broker that said they'd provide it um, through a WebSocket, but that didn't work. Can't even find it for Bitcoin, which is really disappointing. I thought that would be, thought somebody would provide Bitcoin tick data over a WebSocket, but I can't get it to work. So anyway, um, as a result, I had to make my own, um, which meant that on, as well as just publishing this, this tick data, I've got, um, I'll try to drag this over using one hand, if that's gonna work at all. Oh no. There we go. Right, so this is the application number one, which is, like an idiot. Um, effectively, what it's doing is it's just uh, trying to simulate tick data. It's a Poisson process. It's not terribly realistic. There's not enough um, autocorrelation or um, ketosis, but the, it, it's just tick data. Um, you can see at the top what is currently running, um, and at the bottom, the actual ticks coming out. But again, if you were actually trying to do something useful with this information, that's, that's not very interesting. But that this really is just a front end on what back end is collecting this data, which is it's like just a, a, a node event emitter. Um, 
and then publishing it. The important bit is the, the kind of publish function on the back end, which um, I will try to demonstrate in a second. Actually, no, I won't, because that's just going to be too complicated. I've only got so many fingers. Um, so, yeah, that's just what we've seen. Fakerates.meteor.com, that's um, uh, where that is. And then the second application is tradingroom.meteor.com, which looks like that, and hopefully I can demonstrate in a second. So what you can do, you can do if you, is put in the address of um, your publishing application, which fortunately I've already used. It should connect, oh no. I've obviously not deployed it since I sorted the submit problem out, but there we are. Or better. Um, it should show me what streams are available. So there we now we have some details of the, the currently available streams. If I click on one of them, um, it will. So, so this is the, the metadata which is published um, shows you that there is Eurodollar data available. It, it gives you the average delay and the, the volatility, which is just the parameter lens in the, the previous application. This is the important bit where we're basically saying, okay, I want to subscribe. That's just tick data. We're now saying I want to subscribe to candles with these parameters, i.e. I want a maximum of 25 at any given time because that's how many I'm putting on a, a graph. And this is a, a JavaScript um, time interval, so it's milliseconds. So 10 second candles, we can't go very long because I don't want to store loads of data on the server, so um, it's, that's, that's why all the intervals are going to be very short. And it, hopefully it should collect that data. Um, also with a, uh, yeah, I thought something like this might happen. With uh, an estimate of the latency, uh, the problem I've, I've come across is that the, the latency estimate, which was the the, one of the reasons I got into this, obviously relies on you synchronizing time between client and server, which I've been un unable to do accurately, which now means that it's showing a, a latency of about minus 200 milliseconds, which is amazing. We do, <laughs> like, honestly, we can make so much money out of this thing if that's right, um, which it's not. But you also get quite a nice chart down here, um, and you can... Uh, have a look at, I'm sorry, this is, I have used a mouse before, it's just surprisingly difficult when you're trying to do it on a big screen. So you can chart loads of series. Um, and, and actually, the performance of this isn't too bad. It's, it's kind of not too terrible on my phone, which is an S3 and is ancient. You can get a couple of charts of it, it kind of still works out all right. The, the charts are drawn, the charts are a really satisfying bit because as much as kind of formatting stuff to, um, on the, the um, helper, um, is kind of a bit of a, a pain to, to kind of work out the, the geometry of the candles and so on. It, it's not too bad. The actual um, HTML, is th th this is all um, SVG, um, and Meteor's reactive model just works brilliant well, brilliantly well for SVG. I don't know whether you've seen the, the clock example, um, but it, it really is exactly the same. It's just, just kind of once you've formatted the, the data in the right way, um, which is probably like... 30 lines of code. The actual HTML is like another six or seven lines to draw one of these charts, just because it, it, it you know, as, as soon as new candle data comes in, all the existing candle di candlestick data is updated, the chart updates, and you don't really have to do anything else. So this is definitely something I'll, I'll kind of um, look to use again, the, the SVG um, capability, because it's much easier than I actually expected. So um, I can't actually remember what the next thing on my uh, presentation was, not very much more, but we'll see. Oh yeah, next steps. So yeah, find a working cryptocurrency WebSocket so that you could actually have a look at this with some real data rather than something that's made up. Um, get CSS3 animations. So there's another branch of this that I've just um, uh, put together today, which um, uses kind of CSS. So my vision, um, obviously um, hopelessly optimistic, was that you could have some uh, facility where rather than cramming loads of, of uh, kind of charts like this onto a uh, where to start from? Um, the data providers like Bloomberg and Reuters are gradually coming into about the 21st century, but they're still stuck in about 2004 or something like that. So um, the idea of being, being able to use the capabilities of like, modern um, HTML and CSS to, to chart stuff, the stuff that you can do, which I think is generally quite interesting, like on one screen, you could have loads of charts in a f the kind of format which um, lends itself to looking at lo loads of them in a relatively small space, by which I was thinking some kind of like Rolodex of charts where you can see when one automatically will pop out if something interesting is going on or whatever. 
that seems ludicrously ambitious, and in fact it is. I really want to try to do something with Famous, but having already gone down the SVG route, that involves kind of rebuilding it from, from not from the ground up, but doing quite a lot more work. So I've just tried to do something with CSS3, and there's a, a branch of the repo which has that on it. It kind of works relatively well. I'd show you it now, except it would probably take me rather too long just to kind of get it set up, and you, you don't want to wait. But um, do, the, the, my, the next thing I'd, I'd like to do with this, if I get the time, is is have some kind of solution where you get this stuff like nice and smoothly folding away when it's not interesting and then opening back out when it is interesting. So you could have kind of 10 or 12 charts open at the same time and not just have like a huge like scroll list of stuff, which is always not going to look very interesting. Um, and is there anything else? Yeah, so um, if I can do that with S um, CSS3, that'd be great. Um, integrate it with Famous would be even better because frankly, they're, they're going to, even if it essentially comes down to the same thing, they're, um, API is going to do much, much better than I can um, and do anything else that I can think of. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah, so these, um, both of these applications, fake rates, which is the one which has the publication um, function, which is not very complicated at all, but I just think it's the sort of thing which is actually kind of, uh, there's, there's a count example on room count example in the Meteor docs, which is really good. And I just think the more examples of this stuff you look at, the more you actually start to appreciate that you can do stuff with it beyond the, the high level API. And then the, the one that's doing the charting is, is the one below. Um, and then, yeah, I did a blog post um, about um, the low, low level publications API, which is the, and there's some beer in the background, which is what I'm going to drink now. Uh, right, that's it.